Hi guys, and girls I guess, but I know 97% of you are guys. So yesterday I posted this uh, video uh, about asking me questions and gosh, the uh, view count on that is uh, quite low. But uh, it's gotten lots of comments and I've been uh, going through some of those, printed out some of the questions and I was going to wait longer to do this video but uh, I've been hacking around with my Raspberry Pi trying to figure out how to hook up a second camera to it other than the uh, camera module using webcams, which would be a really cool idea, except uh, the drivers and stuff like that for that is really flaky. So I've kind of given up on that. So I'm going to do the uh, Q&A now. So I moved down to the shop because the sound is much better here and I'm wearing a fleece, which I usually do in the shop at least this time of year because it's still cool. And the sawdust really sticks to the fleece, especially if I'm at the table saw because that blade just kicks it onto my fleece and it's hard to get off of that. So I've been wearing an apron for that and that's one of the questions that's been asked, what's with the apron? What is the object that you've built that you are most proud of? Well, that's got to be my 20 inch bandsaw. That's uh, this one here because it's just, it's the culmination of my bandsaw designs uh, and basically I fixed uh, just about everything that I could fix about a bandsaw design. The only thing that I would do differently now is I might make the uh, back of the shaft adjustable a little bit just to tweak it if the frame warps a little bit. Now of course I do like my other projects too. The Panther Rotor is a close second. Uh, the Jointer is another favorite one. But there's so many projects it's hard to say what's your favorite. How's your shoulder, wrists, tennis elbow, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, whatever. It seems uh, everybody thinks of it as something else and to be honest, well it is definitely something related to the bicep. It's gotten better so I, it doesn't hurt anymore unless I do a lot of raking and stuff like that. So I avoid that sort of thing and certainly uh, big construction projects are not something that uh, I'm contemplating. But as long as I don't lift a whole lot of stuff, it's fine. Um, I don't know if it's tendonitis or something else. The problem is you pretty much have to diagnose that sort of thing before you see a doctor because the diagnosis is determined by what sort of doctor you see. You see a doctor and specializes in X, they will diagnose X. Which basically means you have to figure it out yourself and I just don't know what it is. But it has been less of a problem. It's now back to what it was about before we moved to the rural property because uh, it's been bothering me back then already. And at that time I built the uh, 20 inch bandsaw so I am thinking of building a bigger bandsaw when I have the time for it so that sort of thing yes but uh, home renovation projects or buildings that sort of thing definitely out. Why did you stop working as an engineer? Well I still do do engineering for this sort of work. Um, in fact it's more fun engineering than what I used to do at my job which was working at Research in Motion, which after I left got renamed to BlackBerry. I left because it was just becoming less fun. And I had something else lined up which then ended up not panning out, which in turn turns out to be a lucky sort of thing because I've been enjoying life like this much more than if I'd gotten another job. Um, but I, was, I felt I was fighting an uphill battle and that I like things to be more like a small company and they're like, no, we want to join the men's club by which they meant uh, Motorola, Ericsson, Nokia, Siemens because those were the big guys at the time in the wireless telecom field. And <laughs> you got to be careful what you wish for. I mean, where are Motorola, Ericsson, Nokia and Siemens now? They're not the big players. Um, and RIM or BlackBerry kind of went the same way, perhaps even ahead of them. So it was good timing for me to leave. I didn't anticipate that things would go quite the way they did, but it was a good time to leave. How is the trash picking situation where you're now compared to the previous places you lived? Well, I used to live in Ottawa and before that in Waterloo in Southern Ontario. And this area is not as affluent as Ottawa or Waterloo. So the trash picking situation is not nearly as good, um, which kind of sucks. But on the other hand, to be surrounded by people that are perhaps a bit more frugal than where I came from is nice too. It's just uh, having lots of nice trash <laughs> does have its benefits. So I have not found any significant amount of wood on the curb since moving, which is why I've had to buy two by fours and stuff like that. And I didn't think it was worth bringing all of my old wood from the old place. 
In retrospect, I should have brought more of it, but oh well. Do your patents still result in royalties? Ha 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 ha. So I don't own any patents. Uh, I've got a number of patents on my name from my previous employer um, because they're very keen on patenting as much as possible, which high tech companies in general are. The key to patents is quantity, not quality. Um, in fact, you know, the idea is that you want to patent something that is an original invention, but that's actually a bad strategy. You want to invent, you want to patent stuff that is not original and is obvious because those are the patents that are best for extortion of your competitors because uh, that's what patenting is all about. It's not about spreading knowledge. It's, it's an extortion racket. And so you want to patent something that is obvious and ideally something that your competitors will stumble across anyways. It's not like they're going to look at your patent and copy your stuff. You basically want what they call a submarine patent where you patent an obvious technique. Other people are bound to do the same thing and then you can say, aha, ha, ha. You gotta pay us money because guess what? We have a patent. Doesn't matter that you didn't copy this from us. Doesn't matter that you thought of it yourself. We got a patent, you gotta pay us. That's how it works. It's basically a legalized extortion racket. Uh, I, I don't think much of patents. And in terms of protecting innovations and innovators, no, patents are for big established players to protect themselves against innovators. Again, for this very same reason, because the process of getting patents is very expensive and very time consuming. So somebody who has an invention and a company to build a patent is a big distraction. And even then, if somebody copies you, it is an expensive thing to fight. So patents are mostly used like, look, we got a hundred junk patents against your 20 junk patents. Um, guess what? We can sue you for those patents. And sure, most of those are bogus. But you know what? This process is unreliable. And even if 100% of our patents are bogus, some of those are gonna stand up and then we'll nail you for it. And so pay us up, it's not worth the fight. That's how patents work. What is a tool or procedure that people don't pay much attention to, but they really should? Well, the one thing I can think of is wood movement. People just don't seem to take that into account. So they'll put trim across the end grain of say a table or something like that where you really should have say a breadboard end or no trim at all and then wonder why the whole thing explodes on them in that uh, the table ends up changing with, th with humidity changes and the trim comes off. Um, that sort of wood movement thing is also going to spell the end of river tables because with seasonal changes the epoxy is going to delaminate from the wood and they're all going to look like shit and then everybody's going to wonder why were ever what made people thinking about all these river tables uh and the guy who actually invented the idea of a river table he actually had the uh, glass sort of inset a step below which means he thought of the whole wood movement thing and his tables won't be coming apart but of course everybody's epoxy pours river table type things yeah anyways so wood movement is something that a lot of people don't understand and then the, the, the opposite of that is people don't realize that plywood doesn't move a whole lot. Um, so it is safe to put a piece of plywood in a frame and not allow for movement because the plywood sort of moves like long grain in each direction because the long grain strength of the laminates is much stronger than the cross grain strength. So basically the movement is determined by the long grain. So essentially you have like two long grains. Thickness will still be cross grain variations but in terms of does the panel expand in a way that you shouldn't uh, glue it into a drawer bottom? No, it's just fine that way. So, so that's something that people don't really think about. They seem to go by either ignoring it or by mantra that you should always have a panel so it can expand. Adam Savage regularly uh, talks about how he likes your videos and mentions you. I'm aware of that, uh, mostly through comments. I do watch some of his videos, but he produces a lot of videos and I don't have time to watch that many. I love it that he likes my stuff. He's famous. Uh, I even sent him an email once, but uh, never got a reply. I don't know if it actually ended up directly in Adam Savage's inbox. At any rate, I wasn't gonna retry. So hey, Adam, if you're watching, hi, send me an email. <laughs> um, as he's mentioned me since then, so I guess, the possibility that I would have creeped him out uh, isn't the case. That was a few years ago that uh, I emailed. It was after he mentioned me on uh, one of his Maker Fair speeches. He seems to have fairly consistently mentioned me in those. What happened to your dad's old tools? Does your family still have the shop? And what about a Mogula camp? 
We still have the shop. My mom just stores stuff in it. My mom is not somebody who would use a workshop. So I did uh, really tidy it up a few years ago and you know get things in working order. But to my mom, it's just a storage space. So unfortunately, it's not really functional. And I haven't had the time to tinker there lately. And just, I'm actually much more happy with how I've got my own shop set up, just in terms of the tools being just right for me for my kind of projects. So I haven't had time to work there lately. And now it's like, it's almost impossible. Well, yeah, it's just not practical to go there with the pandemic because it's too far to drive and wouldn't want to fly and wouldn't want to leave the family alone for that long and why and da 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 da. So yeah, still got that. Uh, a Mogla cab, they're trying to sell it. If you want to buy it, uh, shoot me an email. Uh, they're thinking of trying to break it up into smaller chunks because as a business, it's not worth as much as individual cottages because people are willing to pay hundreds of thousands for a cottage, yet balk at the idea of paying a few hundred dollars to rent one for a week, which economically makes no sense whatsoever. I would sooner be renting a cottage than having the hassle and cost of owning one. What's your status in relation to Marble Machine X by Winter Gatan? Uh, that actually used to be the first answer in the frequently asked question document on my website because I used to get emailed about that an awful lot. Um, so he actually emailed me when he started building his first marble machine. He had some questions about gears and I did have some advice for him about that in terms of how to make that work so it'd be stiff enough, which he did actually follow. Um, and when his uh, video came out, I was like, wow, oh my God, this is going to be big. And I immediately posted it on my social media uh, when it still had a few hundred views on it. And of course that video's got, I don't know, I think 80 million views now. Um, and I have emailed with him back and forth a few times. He's approached me even, I think one time about helping with some parts for his Marble Machine X, but I, it's lack of time on my part that is a big problem for that sort of thing. So I haven't helped him any. I uh, have exchanged email with him from time to time, shot a few barbs, sort of, sort of say uh, by email, I'm, I think his machine is way too complicated. Although given his criteria, uh, I mean, if you want to achieve exactly what you want, what he says he wants to achieve and make the constraints that, then it really does need to be that complicated. But I think, uh, I mean, the goal is to take the machine on tour, but I think just continuing to work on the machine is working out really well as a career for him. So I'm wondering if he's even keen on actually taking it on tour. And uh, now we got a pandemic, so uh, that, Problem is punted into the future. He can just keep uh, making it better. But I think it's a really cool project. I do watch his videos. Does your woodworking ever cause you problems in your relationship with your wife in terms of the space it takes up? That was the question. Well, the space has never really been a problem. Rachel's never been very much into using the basement and my stuff has always been in the basement. And then on moving, we just made sure we have enough room. So this house here, one of the deciding factors for why we bought this one is because it has a huge unfinished part of the basement. So I've got tons of space here. Like this is, uh, in terms of square footage I've got to play with, this is comparable to say Frank Howarth's shop or Jay Bates' shop um, or half of April Wilkerson's shop. So yeah, hasn't been a problem that way. What is a problem is time because I love to tinker and she would like me to spend more time with the family and I do spend lots of time with the family. I would like to have more time to tinker and sometimes she says like, well, don't you want to take a vacation sometimes? And I'm like, well, does a vacation mean I get to do what I want to do? <laughs> Which of course, no, that means spending time with the family, not what you want to do. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, there is the conflict of time, but uh, not in terms of space. Did you ever find a bandsaw to sawmill conversion that you're happy with? Well, my bandsaw on a dolly sawmill, that was the best I've come up with. But uh, on the move, I didn't bring that stuff because the bandsaw lives in the basement. And uh, how do I move logs? I don't have a tractor. And I'd have to move the bandsaw up to the garage or move the logs into the basement. So I don't have that anymore. Um, but that was, I was more happy with that. It was much better in terms of vibrations because the vibrations onto the saw was vertical. And of course the saw's weight onto the dolly kind of really stiffened that up much more so than the horizontal arrangement with my 14 inch bandsaw sawmill thing. 
Um, that is the hard part about building a sawmill. It just needs to be stiff and heavy. Where do you obtain your project ideas from? Where did you learn to engineer as you do? Well, uh, an analogy to that is watching our kids, like watching our two and a half year old, and you know, he picks things up and flips it around and does this and that to it, and I'm thinking, we never taught him how to do that. You know, he just figured it out. It's just intuitive to him as it is to everybody. You know, if you want to look at the bottom of the box, how to flip it over and that sort of movement or you're walking and then you suddenly need to turn around to do that without falling over. Um, to somebody who couldn't do that, it would seem like, wow, how did you learn how to do that? But it just kind of comes naturally to him, of course, as it does to everybody. And the same thing is with engineering ability. It is not something that is comes from school. Some people have an intuition for that sort of thing and others don't. I find it surprising, like even some of the bigger YouTubers in this space don't have actually that much intuition for that by my judgment. There are some people that can look at a structure or a mechanism and say it's like, yeah, there's a stress here and it's gonna fail that way. And to other people, it's not obvious. How do you teach that? I don't know. Do you feel like you need to stretch the boundaries to remain relevant on YouTube? Uh, it's actually more the opposite. There's of course the whole um, chasing trends like river tables and epoxy pours and whatnot, whatever the latest sort of thing is, but I haven't actually tried that. I'm sure for the people that are early in the trend it works out, but if you're late in the trend it's probably quite the opposite because there'll be way more content on that topic than people care to see. Um, but I find uh, the stuff that's more in the straight and narrow tends to do better if I really do a deep dive into some topic and you know I get into the science of it and all that and most of my audience isn't into that sort of thing so they tend to, they kind of tune out and then I get fewer views so yeah stretching the boundaries in my space doesn't result in more views unfortunately because I would love to stretch the boundaries a bit more everyone seems to pronounce your name differently how do you pronounce it or how would you like it pronounced I'm very flexible of how people pronounce it because when I tell people how it's pronounced, Matthias, they will invariably mispronounce it because if you're not a native German speaker, the subtleties of what matters is lost to you. So even though it sounds the same to you, it won't be the same. And I dislike that sort of thing so much that I'm very flexible with how people pronounce my name because it's pointless trying to tell people, no, no, more like this, no, 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 put the emphasis, <sighs> forget it, just, just, whatever, just call me Matt. But I've even offended one person that way, a girl I was dating, she was offended at, like, I'm not smart enough to know how to pronounce your name? Do you have any life advice for somebody just graduating and thinking about getting involved in a tech startup? Ah, uh, it's been 27 years since I graduated and things have changed a lot since then. I know when I was recruiting, I was always looking for uh, projects that people have done on their own. And I even said so much, you know, like projects that you have done outside of school or work. Because especially school projects, as far as I'm concerned, they don't count anything because they are challenges that are artificially created so that the average student can do them, which means if you can do it, that does not make you above average. Um, so you gotta do something, find some useful thing and figure out how to solve it um, and that is much more challenging than a school project because you will encounter problems that you have no idea where to start. You have no idea what language to choose, what technology is going to work, what you're, is what you're doing even feasible? So there's so much extra things that you have to do for projects on your own. And if that's not your thing, well, then you're just average and you will do like average. So if the average person can't find a job, well, that's how it is. Um, I found it interesting, came across uh, that in India, the hottest uh, career, the hottest degree has become the most useless or the least valuable degree because everybody's going into computer programming there. But as is the case with most people who go into computer programming, they graduate, but they don't actually know how to do it effectively. And so is the case in India. And nobody needs a computer programmer that doesn't know how to program computers. And even here in Canada, even coming out of Waterloo, people, learn the stuff in school and still don't know how to do it. What are your most favorite or top five YouTube channels? Um, well, I have a list actually of that on my website, woodgears.ca slash links.html, but uh, top five, well, kind of hard to put those in order. There's Winter Katan, 
There's Matthias Berger. He doesn't have a whole lot of views, but every time it's like, oh wow, a new Matthias Berger video. Um, with the pandemic, he's had more time to make videos because he's a teacher. Um, so there's been a few of his videos lately. He's gone for six months before that without a video. Matthias Hornberger, he's really good at the engineering aspect of it. Um, and his projects are very involved. I think he's had more time lately too because of the pandemic. Rainfall projects, that's another one of my favorites. Um, that's not to say that I like every one of these channels' videos. There's disappointments in there sometimes too. Um, Colin Furs, that's the only one that's a really big one that I'll list here. Not that I don't like big ones, but most of them, being big kind of gets to their heads. And that just, and then everybody's talking about it already, so there's nothing unique about it. But Colin Furs, somehow he's still got that sort of genuine thing, even though he's made it really, really big. So, and then another one, Jeremy Fielding. He's recently gotten hired by Dustin of Smarter Every Day. His videos aren't that super duper, but it's just really genuine and he talks about motors and stuff like that. He's got a real good genuine understanding. And so Dustin is now paying him to help with his stuff. And there was one where they made this thing to hit a baseball really fast. And it was interesting to watch that video because it became clear to me that Jeremy being much smaller on YouTube understands technically way more than uh, Dustin does. Dustin's skill, of course, is enthusiasm and presenting things really well. He is awesome at that. Um, but there's lots of smaller channels that are kind of overlooked. Uh, I quite like Jeremy Fielding's. There's been some back and forth between us. He's mentioned me a few times. I think I may have mentioned him before. What are all of the injuries due to woodworking that uh, you've had? Well, most of my injuries are not woodworking related, but in terms of things that have gotten hurt, um, I have, uh, let's see, I cut my, I, I stuck a knife in here one time, um, the scar is right there, and I cut into this finger one time, I was 16 when that happened, this one I think might have been 17, um, yeah, and I nicked, I cut into uh, my finger on a table sock just uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was this finger... There's no, there's no scar visible from that because it was, uh, I mean, it's just kind of scraped the surface. Um, I've injured uh, this finger much worse just with uh, a knife cutting meat and cutting the top, the end millimeter off of it. Or maybe a little bit less than that. Uh, um, so yeah, injuries from woodworking for me are a relatively rare thing because I'm fairly careful around my tools. Oh yeah, another one, I think maybe also when I was about 16, I, uh, I cut into my finger with a bandsaw. Uh, which again, I barely cut deep enough to draw blood because I was cutting very slowly. The piece I was cutting was bigger on the top than where I was holding it, so the blade came out the bottom before I came out the top where I held it with my thumb. And so cut into that a little bit, which cut just deep enough to draw a little bit of blood, so I put a band-aid on it. In what ways have you improved your skills over the years? I don't know, it's it's hard to say. I've gotten much better at filming, much better at talking to the camera, much better at writing. In terms of actually uh, figuring things out, uh, certainly the projects that I've built uh, in the last 10 years are more advanced than what I've done before, but that just comes from doing more of that sort of thing. And then something like a bandsaw, you know, a very involved project, but uh, that is a matter of iterating over it. Like the other bands I showed at the start, that's my fourth iteration on that sort of thing. It's hard to say how I've gotten better at this sort of thing because the change is subtle enough that it's hard to notice myself. Some time ago, you were thinking of going back to working at a job. Yes, um, last summer and before that, I was thinking about that. Um, but I was only looking for part-time work, which is not ideal because it sends the wrong signal it says that you're not so serious about really wanting a job not like a young person who just graduated and wants to dedicate themselves 100 percent to it and work overtime and whatnot um so thinking about it it's like from a perspective employer that does not make me very attractive and also being big on social media is also a liability again if i'm an employer it's like i just don't want trouble or anything like that and if you hire somebody who's got a big profile on social media and has got a big mouth, that can end very badly. So you're taking a risk there. 
So nothing, uh, no bites. And in the meantime, then Rachel got pregnant, in which I knew that was going to suck up tons and tons of time. We're still waiting for the baby. Should be coming any time now. Um, so I realized, like, in terms of having time, I just don't have the time for it. And I'm not lonely, even with this whole pandemic type of thing. Um, I miss having time to spend alone. On account of all the social distancing, I don't get very much alone time anymore. Oh yeah, and in terms of the whole pandemic sort of thing, the situation here in New Brunswick is, it's almost like we're in a bubble to ourselves because we had no active cases for quite a while. And then a couple of cases popped up, but I think they managed to basically check everyone around those cases um, so that I'm pretty sure there is no cases in the wild. There hasn't been a new case reported for over a week here. That's for a population of 700,000. So if the whole world was like New Brunswick, uh, it's like, yeah, we'd have this thing licked. And that's not to say that New Brunswickers are so much more virtuous that we have it licked, whereas New Yorkers don't. It's, I think it's just a matter of geography and low population density. You look across the states, and the states that have the least amount of problems are also the ones that take it the least serious, because those are tends to be the redneck type of states. And it's not that being a redneck makes it better at dealing with it. It's like the redneck states are low population density states, and population density has so much to do with it. I think uh, high-rise apartment buildings and public transit are both just really good at spreading germs and New Brunswick is low population density and here we got it licked and they're uh, easing up on things the only catch with that is as we ease up on things we could set ourselves up for a doubling period of three days and we won't know because we don't have any cases in the wild but uh, yeah things are pretty good here okay I think that's enough uh, questions answered for now maybe I'll answer more let's see if other things come up now it's time to put this together, delete the bad takes, maybe get rid of some ums and ahs. Nice thing about doing live streams, which this is not, is that they're really easy to make because you just ramble on and on. You don't have to worry about uh, cutting things out or getting it just right because you can't. The downside is the videos end up much longer and the information density is lower. And that makes it uh, kind of suck from a viewer's perspective. And that's why I decided not to do this as a live stream, but to make it a bit more like a live stream in that I'm just talking to the camera and not editing as much. Anyways, I think that may be the end of this video. Maybe not. Uh, you can tell because this video may or may not end right now.